We have four gospel accounts. The gospel rightly understood the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. In fact, the Greek titles of the books isn't the gospel according to Mark. It's just according to Mark. There is only one gospel. And on in that basis, we have the testimony of two or three, nay, four witnesses to the events. We can be certain of their accuracy. And yet, each of the four gospels draws attention to different details. John's being most unique, writing almost certainly last, and writing to an audience that internally, there's evidence in the gospel of John that he assumes we're familiar with the material. And so he's intentionally, I think, filling in gaps The other three Gospels we call synoptic Gospels because so much of the material overlaps. If you discount the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, almost all of John is unique. And his telling of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is also um, very focused and different in many ways than the other Gospels. Not conflictingly different, but perhaps you noticed he spent... No time mentioning the sun being blackened out, the dead rising from the grave, the the temple's veil being torn. No, John focuses, and as I read and reread this, trying to think, okay, how do I draw attention to what I think John's drawing attention to, really is on the, the intrigue, the back and forth between Pilate and the Jews, And again and again and again, just tremendous, awful, terrible irony taking place. Irony being that which is not expected, that which is contrary to expectation. And so I want to draw attention to six powerful, dramatic, in many ways terrible ironies in John's account. Um, As we consider this. Many of them, nearly all of them, actually taking place in the, in the mock trial, a corrupt back and forth between the Jews and Pilate. And so I'd like to first draw attention to this first irony. The Jews, who are very, very eager to celebrate God's Passover righteously, according to the law, without defilement, hate and put to death God's Passover. The Jews who are very eager to celebrate God's Passover and to do so according to the law in a holy manner, in a right way, these Jews want no part of the true Passover. In fact, they want to put him to death. John draws attention to this in John 18, verse 28. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. Oh, no, we can't go in a dirty Gentile's home, not within 24 hours of the Passover. Don't want to become unclean. There's tremendous irony, nay, hypocrisy. These men are falsifying evidence, clearly do not care about truth, righteous judgment. They want what they want. And they'll kill Jesus to get what they want, so they think. And yet, here we see they are zealous. They are eager to celebrate the Passover again. You heard Jake read about how they urged the Roman soldiers to to break the legs of those being crucified because they didn't want them hanging up contrary to the law during the Passover. Tremendous irony. Note the, the potential in the human heart for Draw, jaw dropping hypocrisy and blindness. Here is the one who the Passover lamb pictures. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5 7, cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are in leaven. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. John the Baptizer in chapter 1, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Here is the one, the entire Passover system being enacted out year after year after year after year, pictured, prepared these people for. And on the one hand, they want to observe the Passover according to the law. They don't want to break the rules. They don't want to be unclean. They don't want to be defiled. 
even as they murder, kill, cry out for the blood of the true Passover lamb. That, that irony is glaring in the text. There's another um, irony relating to the Jews and the high priests. These are in zealously nationalistic people. We saw that they don't even want to go in the home of a Gentile. They're no lovers of Rome. In chapter 6 of John's gospel, they wanted to take Jesus by force and make him king, and he would have nothing to do with it. And we talked about this last week, is how their intentions for a king was one who would throw off Rome, fight Rome, defeat Rome, exalt the nation of Israel. The very things Jesus will do at his second coming, and not just to Rome, but to all the rebellious nations of the world. That's what they wanted. These are a very nationalistic people, and they care about their little place they have. Earlier in John's gospel, after the resurrection of the raising of Lazarus, we were let into some of their machinations. They say to themselves, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. That's their great concern. They care about Israel. They care about their nation. Yet these people who hate Rome and despise the Gentiles swear unfailing loyalty to Caesar in order to put Israel's true king to death. It's it's remarkable. (laughs) These people won't even go in the house of Gentiles so that they don't become contaminated. And yet... They goad Pilate into crucifying Jesus. Pilate is a coward. He is corrupt. He does not care about justice. He just cares about trying to make peace. He's a pragmatist. And so in John 19, 12, from then on, Pilate sought to release him. And the Jews get wind of this. Pilate's not on board. So they press him. The Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. Implied threat. Do you want to get back to Caesar, Pilate, that you treat lightly insurrectionists, rebels, those who would claim his throne, his crown? Jesus has already made it perfectly clear to Pilate. He is no, um, he is no threat in that sense to Caesar. His kingdom is not of this world. He's not trying to start an armed revolution. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat of the place called the Stone Pavement, and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for Passover. It was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Jaw-dropping hypocrisy. And the lengths people will go to in the human heart to get what you want. The way sin will drive you crazy. If you asked these chief priests weeks, months ago, is it possible you'll ever claim you have no king but Caesar? I, I don't imagine they'd recognize even the remotest possibility. But here, when it looks like what they want is slipping through their fingers, they double down. It's not unique to sin. You remember Saul, if you're in um, Jake's ABF, you remember Saul wants to kill David. Why? So that his son Jonathan can inherit the throne. And yet, in his anger, pursuing David, at one point, Saul tries to pin his son Jonathan to the wall with a spear. It doesn't make any sense. Because sin, in the human heart, drives us to crazy things because it wants what it wants. These people want what they want. And so contrary to all their desires, everything they're about, they're pro-Israel, they're anti-Gentile, anti-Roman. If we have to say we have no king but Caesar, so be it, kill him. Terrible hypocrisy and irony. John highlights that as they press Pilate, the coward, to commit the author of life to death. Now let's look at Pilate. There's some irony here in the text. We have two extended interviews with, between Pilate and Jesus. And amazingly, and here's number three, Pilate asks two of life's most important questions to the very one who can truly answer them. 
And yet he pays no regard to the answers. He has no interest in the answers. John wants us to see this, this terrible irony. Again, you see the first. In John 18, Pilate entered, verse 33, and he called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? I submit to you that is one of the most important questions you could ask. Is this the Davidic heir? Is this the Messiah? Is this the promised one? Jesus knows he's not asking it sincerely. Do you say this on your own account? Do you say this because you actually want to know Pilate? Or did others say it about me? Pilate freely acknowledges, am I a Jew? No, I don't care. I have no interest if you are, in fact, the king of the Jews. Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? The, the, the king of the Jews, the king of the earth is standing in front of him. He asks the right question and he cares nothing about the answer. A little later, in 1837, then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. Just, just pause. Pilate is talking to the son of God. He's interviewing him. And Jesus is talking back, respectfully enough, except when he doesn't answer. And he's asking the right questions, in some sense. And he cares nothing about the answers. He is so close, and yet so far. For this purpose, Jesus says, I was born. And for this purpose, I've come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Perhaps, maybe you're reading this for the first time, you haven't heard the story. Perhaps Pilate will evidence he's of the truth. And he'll listen to Jesus' voice. Pilate's response, what is truth? The one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life is standing in front of him. Truth incarnate is so close he could reach out and touch him. And this comes off his lips. What is truth? Is Pilate one of his who is of the truth, who listens to Jesus' voice? No, he is not. Terribly and terrifyingly ironic. We can grow up listening to the truth. We can grow up in churches. We can grow up being that close and have no interest in the answers. It's, it's, this, what's going on in Pilate's heart can happen in ours. It's just put on display here by John. It's just terrible. This man, unless something dramatic happens after he leaves the pages of Scripture, is even now in hell. He came this close. <laughs> These questions were on his lips. With the Son of God, truth incarnate, in front of him. And he couldn't be further away. Fourth, a cowardly and corrupt pagan judge unintentionally echoes John the Baptist in publicly identifying Jesus to the crowd. A, public, a cowardly and corrupt pagan judge unintentionally echoes John the Baptist in publicly identifying Jesus to the crowd. You remember back in chapter 1? Of John, after the first 18 verses, the prologue, it begins with John. And even though we know him as John the Baptist or John the Baptizer, in John's gospel, he's really John the Witness. There became a man sent of God to bear witness. And he did bear witness. And he testified. And what do we see him do? In 129, Jesus has just returned from the temptation in the wilderness. The next day, John, he saw Jesus coming toward him. And he said, behold, the Lamb of God. Who takes away the sin of the world. And the next day he looked, in verse 36, at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. So God ordains sovereignly that this last and greatest Old Testament prophet will publicly identify Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God. Strangely, and if you've been reading John's gospel, I don't think this connection can be missed. Not intentionally, just strangely enough, very similar words twice also come from Pilate's mouth. John 19.5. So Jesus came out wearing a crown of thorns and a purple robe. And Pilate said to them, behold the man. Nine verses later, John 19.14. Now it was the day of preparation of Passover. It was about the sixth hour. And he, Pilate, said to the Jews, behold your king. This one doing it in mockery. 
He's actually trying to stick it to the Jews. The Jews got him. He, he can't let word get back to Caesar that he's soft on crime, that he's soft on rebe- rebels, but he's not happy about it. And so he's trying to stick it back to the Jews every way he can, make it sting. That's why he writes what he writes above Jesus' said. He's not trying to honor Jesus. But as we read the book, some irony here that the beginning of Jesus' ministry and at the very end of his life, public figure, behold the lamb, behold the king, behold your king. Some irony there. Two more. Number five, also centered on Pilate. In a further attempt to provoke and insult the Jews, Pilate gives Jesus his true and proper title. In a further attempt to provoke and insult the Jews, Pilate gives Jesus his true title. This pagan, this Roman, who cares nothing of Israel and its law and its king, yet he properly names Jesus. John 19, 16, 22, 16, 19, 16 to 22. And what we're seeing all around Jesus, who's calm, collected, in charge, these people are fighting, these people are pushing each other back and forth, Pilate and the Jews. So he delivered him over to be crucified. And they took Jesus and went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Jews don't like that. Many of the Jews read this inscription from the place where Jesus was crucified near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and Greek. But Pilate wants to insult everybody. And they said, the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews. Rather, this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate said, What I've written, I've written. And so, strangely, not due to any righteous intent on his part, rather due to him wanting to provoke and irritate the Jews, he rightly names Jesus. The Son of God is crucified with the proper title over his head in three languages for all the world to see. Remarkable. Remarkable. Final irony. Now we'll look to Jesus. Throughout this whole account, Jesus is being taken places and being flogged and having crowns put on his head and being asked questions. And he appears powerless, impotent, weak. Soldiers strike him. Yet the one mocked as powerless is supremely powerful. The first hint of this in John 18 29 to 32. So Pilate went outside and said to them, What accusation do you bring against this man? What are the charges? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you, which is to say, Who needs charges? Would we be bringing him here if he weren't guilty? Come on. That's how much these Jews were interested in righteousness, justice, the law, true judgments. They'd prefer not even to make charges. Clearly he's guilty of something. We wouldn't have brought him to you. Just kill him already. Pilate said to them, take him yourself and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, it's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. And we'll stop him a little later in the book of Acts with Stephen. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. John, the gospel writer, wants us to see in this perverse wickedness and injustice, a sovereign Christ. He's not helpless. He's not powerless. This is meekness, power under control. And even as they squabble and fight and bicker wickedly amongst each other, they are doing nothing but fulfilling his word and his purpose. 
John 19, 10 through 11. Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? I'm the one in power here, Jesus. Why aren't you talking to me? Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Jesus doesn't recognize that. He says it's the exact opposite. It's not that Pilate's a person of power and authority. He'd have nothing if it wasn't given to him. That's why Jesus isn't trembling in front of Pilate. Probably the clearest mark of the sovereign control and power of our Lord is the statement read at the end of 19. It is finished bowed down his head, and gave up his spirit. Now, you might think I'm making a big deal out of little deal. If it wasn't for something Jesus said about 10 chapters earlier. In chapter 10, verse 17 to 18, Jesus says this. For this reason, the Father loves me. See, unlike you and I, where why does God love us? Well, because he loves us, because it's the overflow of his nature. Jesus insists there's actually reasons, merit, cause for the Father to love him. Why does the Father love me? Because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. And I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Now bear that in mind. Let me read again. John 19, 28 to 30. After this, and I'll pause again. See how John emphasizes how Jesus is in control. After this, knowing that all was finished, Jesus said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. No one took it from him. The early church would speak with wonderful irony and with the Lord Jesus reigning from the cross. John highlights all this and much more. I mean, we've just scratched the surface of a chapter and a half, but I would highlight the wickedness of sin, the the duplicity, the hypocrisy, the double standards, the self-deception and the delusion of sin. Very religious people can be totally blind to their hypocrisy. Very, very religious people, zealous to keep the law and observe the Passover can put the Passover lamb to death. People claiming to have life's important questions can ask them with no interest in the answers. And all throughout, Christ reigns sovereignly. God's purposes are not thwarted. Jesus' death was not a tragic accident. It wasn't terrible mistake. It was the plan from the foundation of the world. It was his plan, his father's plan. He came willingly to do it. He died on our behalf. He died willingly for you, for me, for our sin as a substitute. He died fully in control. He could have got off that cross any time he chose. He could have called a legion of angels to come, and he did not. His sufferings were voluntary. He did it out of love for us and ultimately love and commitment for his father. We should view it that way. Even as Pilate and the Jews squabble and fight and claw and scrape with each other, he reigns sovereignly. His will is done. It is finished. We have a word of prayer as we prepare to transition now to a time of communion